Hey, everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Jane Plant from Ontario, Canada. And uh, she was gracious enough to volunteer to tell her mind body success story uh, to the world. So, welcome, Jane. How are you? I'm very good, Dan. Thank you for having me here. Awesome. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I've been following you on social media for a while now. And Nice to, to be here with you. Awesome. Always a pleasure to meet people that uh, are out in the world who have been able to take these mind-body concepts and apply them and prove to yourself, and now we'll prove to the world that this stuff is real. And um, the phrase I really like is, this stuff works, folks. So welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so so what you. Can you what can you tell us about your journey? Uh, give me an idea of what was going on, symptoms, when they started, what was going on, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, we have to wind the clock back quite a while to the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. 1985, I was in a car accident, rear-ended by a tow truck, and um, diagnosed with whiplash after that. Sure. Uh, so that's when the sensations in my back started. Uh, went off to physio. I mean, I was 20 years old, you know, went to the doctor off to physio, just kind of did what everybody said to do. And life went on. The sensations stayed. Uh, maybe they got somewhat better. Uh, and at the same time, it was about the time when I was starting off to post-secondary education. And um, I had chosen to go into the field of dental hygiene which is also a physically demanding job. Standing, it, leaning over, uh, yep, exactly. for hours and hours a day. For hours and hours, stationary positions. So, uh, you know, the, the sensation stayed and, and intensified, definitely. They started in my lower back, and over the years, they kind of moved up to my mid-back, uh, up to my upper back, my neck, my shoulders. But all the time that this was going on, I I believed, and the medical profession definitely um, reinforced that belief, that the car accident combined with the profession I had chosen to go into were the reasons for, you know, all the pain in my back. Um, I had had... Um, different tests over the years, x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans. Uh, they show different diagnosis, um, you know, degenerative disc disease, which you're, when you're in your late 20s, maybe sounds like a scary thing. Now I know it means absolutely nothing. But right. at, that, at that time, <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, that sounds, that sounds scary. Um, I had herniated discs as well found on the tests. Repetitive strain injury, they said, because of holding the static positions in my job. Nerve impingement, they found in C6, C7. And this was found when I started having numbness and tingling running down my arms into my fingers. My fingers would become numb, turn purple, then turn brown, which kind of also made it hard to clean people's teeth. But <laughs> anyway... Uh, I yeah. kept going on. Um, I Over the 37 years that I was in chronic pain, I had five different family doctors, saw orthopedic surgeons, multiple different ones over the years, saw neurologists, uh, went to physio, went to chiro, massage therapy, athletic therapists, naturopath, osteopath. Uh, Reiki, you name it, I tried it. Uh, and I mean, now, well, even back then, I knew the definition of insanity was trying the same things over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah, I love that. But I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought by doing nothing, I was giving up. Mm -hmm. So I, I kept trying so common. These, <laughs> these modalities over and over. Maybe I'd switch from one physiotherapist to a different one thinking, well, they're going to have the answer. Somebody's going to have the answer. 
Um, my life had become very small. I, I couldn't sit for long periods of time, which obviously in my profession became very problematic. I couldn't stand still for long periods of time. Uh, lying flat out on the floor was where I found the most comfort and relief. So you too, I know. And you I found spent that. Laying flat, <laughs> you're letting your back go uh, into yes. the floor as you stare at the yes. ceiling. And go, as I stare at the ceiling. Oh, the ceiling's got a crack in it. Or there's yes. a bug up there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and actually, Dan, on my home kitchen floor, it's a cushion floor, and there's a spot on it where it's worn from, because that was kind of my favorite spot to lie, and it's worn. And when I now uh, scrub my kitchen floor, because now I can do that, right. I always see that spot, and it kind of reminds me of, you know, where I was, and uh, definitely is a reminder to keep myself on track to where where I am now which you right. know you'll hear about in a few minutes but um yes yeah, so and even at work between patients on my lunch hour we had a a gym in the basement of our work I would run down there not that I was working out I was lying flat on the mat down there uh, other than eating my lunch you know just trying to get some relief before I had to go back uh you know right. and start my next patient after that did you ever stop working or you just kind I, of puffed your way through it I, I did. I definitely, well, five years ago, I left the workforce permanently. But even many, many years before that, I reduced the number of days I worked. So I thought, well, I'll work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I'll have Tuesday, you know, rest days off mm -hmm. in between. Or I'll only work half days because mornings were ge generally as the day went on, my sensations got worse. So on the whole mornings were my best time. So I'll just work right. till noon. And, and luckily I had a different, another hygienist who could come in and kind of, yes. Yeah. So I, you know, I tried all that I could to stay in the workforce because well, financially as well, but I mean, I enjoyed the social aspect of my work. I enjoyed the people that I worked with uh, as well as, you know, the clients that came into my office so um, I was also on many different medications over the years, anti-inflammatories, nerve medication for nerve pain, muscle relaxants to help me sleep, uh, opioids at one point, got a prescription for medical cannabis, also tried many different natural supplements. I never was really much of a pill person, so I always tried the medications reluctantly but also in desperation for something to help. I did find none of them really ever worked that well. And I think now that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the time, I, I didn't really understand why they didn't. Maybe I just thought, well, a different makeup of metabolism. I don't know. But um, I tried them when I had to never really wanted to take them but at points in my life to you know to cope and get through I did sure uh, so I found I was really withdrawing socially any event that I had to go to you know be it a wedding or a, an important family function it it all became in my mind wrapped around how was I going to manage this event mm -hmm. Where was I going to lie down on the floor, you know? Uh, so people wouldn't trip over you. So that's right. And Dan, I've lied on the floor in many funny places. Maybe you had over the years as well. Oh, I was <laughs> I was blessed. When I was working uh, in a corporate office, I had a door in an office. Okay. So mm -hmm. every so often I'd get up, shut the door, take my suit jacket off and lay on the floor. Right, right. <laughs> So, trust me, I know the laying down thing. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I've laid down in park benches, <laughs> um, on the grass, in the back of my car many times at, say, weddings or something. Oh, well, between the ceremony and the 
the start of the dinner, I'm running out and lying in my car and saying to my son, my husband, text me when I have to come back in. Oh, and, and how many times have you been a passenger in the car laying down in the back seat? In the last remember, 10 years, that was the way I traveled. Or, yeah, I remember going out to dinner and mm -hmm. on the way home, I'm laying in the back seat. Yes, yes. Awesome. With so, my seatbelt on, but still thinking this can't yeah. be very safe <laughs> and hoping we weren't in a car accident. Yes. <laughs> I mean, our son, our adult son now lives 90 minutes from here in Ottawa. And so it became that, yes, if there was, I couldn't go visit him on my own. My husband would have to come. I would put on the seatbelt in the back and away we'd go. And when we arrived at his apartment, they would stand visiting and I would be flat out on his floor, but still, you know, participating in the conversation. It's like, hey, how you doing down there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, really, I had had chronic pain my the whole life of life. my son. So for him, it was normal that this was what his mom did. I mean, he had really never known, right. never known any different. So, um. I was also doing a really good job of hiding from everybody how much despair I was really in. Uh, you know, my husband and son would have had an inkling, but I, I really didn't want the family to realize how much misery emotional. and emotional. And I was really living each day to endure the day to get up the next day and, you know, yeah. start over because I Survive. really exactly i really felt like this was a life sentence mm -hmm. um and even though i was told, you've probably been told that by doctors as well oh well, yes yes definitely um i've been told by you know a family physician and and a specialist jane chronic pain well what does chronic mean chronic means forever yeah you know so if you go off Which this is incorrect for anybody listening chronic pain yes. is not forever <laughs> it's not a life sentence <laughs> It definitely is not a life sentence. And that's why I'm out here telling these stories, because I do feel maybe unknowingly, but that the medical system has failed chronic pain patients. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, we need to do better. We need this word to get out. And I mean, my hope is that sometime in my lifetime, it's mainstream, but it's yeah, just... I don't know that it will ever be taught in medical schools because <laughs> the curriculum in the medical schools are funded by pharmaceutical and medical technology and surgical equipment companies and hospitals right. that, you know, it, and it's not that these people are evil. It's just that the mechanism is set up to keep on teaching the same stuff because it is a medical industry more than it is true health care. Um, yes. So that's not any condemnation of what's going on out there, but I don't have hopes that this is going to be taught in every medical school and every doctor will know this because that would take a, whatever, five, $600 million, um, no, billion dollar pain management business and make it crumble. Right. So I, I just right. don't see the people who stand to lose by implementing this being the ones to propagate it. So it's a grassroots thing. People like yeah. me, like you, other TMS coaches telling their stories, success stories. Um, but word is getting out more and more. You know, it you're is. starting to see these little inklings of, hey, there's a news report. There's a something, yeah. you know, yeah. and so brilliant. I stuff. did I did see a news uh, clip and it was a big American station. I forget which one, but they had a little clip on pain reprocessing therapy. Right. And I, I was hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. really excited <laughs> to see that. Cool. Okay. So, so uh, we regressed, <laughs> got off topic right. here. Oh, that is anyway, on topic. Um, well, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> So about 10 years ago, I was still in the workforce and I just knew I had to um, try, I was grasping at straws, but I thought, oh, maybe I'm going to, somebody said, oh, try some yoga because my work, my work environment was also very stressful. It was mm -hmm. very go, go, go. And I just thought, oh, I, 
you yeah, know, you're behind. Yeah. Get the next patient in. Yeah, because that's making money, Dan. <laughs> so yeah. I hate to say that, but my boss was very set on how much the production was per day. So, well, uh, so yeah, anyway, then... I went off to yoga, and um, I, 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 so I learned some meditation. I continued to do that. And I also uh, took a, a mindfulness program, that eight week kind of standard eight week mindfulness okay. program. And I did find those things helpful. Um, you know, maybe I felt 10% better. Uh, so I did know that there was a mind body connection. And I also knew that when my stressors were higher, you know, my sensations would flare more, but that's about as at that time, as much of the connection that I got. Right. I mean, I really still didn't get it at all. <laughs> well, um, sometimes it really has to be like painted out on a big poster board and like right. put in your yes. face for people to get it. <laughs> There's hints out there. Oh, I'm stressed out. I hurt more. Right. The question is why? Right. And so all right, I'll let you keep going. Yeah. So then five years ago, uh, I did end up leaving the workforce. I I really didn't want to, but it had just gotten, the sensations had gotten so overwhelming. I couldn't keep working. I also didn't like the person that I had become at work. I I used to be a very compassionate, caring dental hygienist. And I'll be perfectly honest, it's kind of embarrassing to admit it. But now looking back, I think, well, I was doing, I was in survival, but I wasn't that person anymore. Right. Uh, you know, if I had somebody in my chair complaining that it hurt a little bit when I cleaned their teeth, in my mind, I was thinking, you think you're hurting? <laughs> you know, you have no idea what I'm going through yeah, right so now. Let me let you know what pain really is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Totally kidding. So I left before I did that, Dan. <laughs> I'm sure you did not turn into a sadistic mental no, hygienist. I, no, I didn't. But I didn't like the person in my mind that I was becoming. Right. So, you know, I just thought I, I can't do this anymore. So I left in the hopes, though, that because remember, I was still under the impression that my job was contributing to why I was having so many back sensations. So I left in the hope that that would bring some relief. Definitely didn't. Uh, if anything, maybe it made things worse because now I was at home really with nothing else to focus on other than the sensations and maybe yeah. even by then the pity party of poor me. For sure. Um, so, but, you know, life just kept going on and... <laughs> Uh, doing what I could on days that I could do a few things. Right. But last February, so that would have been just February, 2023. Uh, the last time I had a physiotherapy appointment and when I left the appointment and actually I even spoke of my physiotherapist a little bit about it at the appointment. I said, the fear of the pain is becoming overwhelming. The fear of doing anything, what is going to exist? you know, make it flare today. Um, the fear just was overwhelming every aspect of my life. So we spoke about it a little bit. I mean, she didn't really have any answers for that. But when I left and came home, I just said to myself, maybe I have to talk to a therapist about, you know, my fear of my pain. And, and at that time, I was just thinking, you know, just a regular therapist, I really didn't know what I was thinking. But this was the first that this idea had kind of popped into my head. So I took to the internet, and I just googled fear of chronic pain. And, you know, a few different things came up. And this word neuroplastic came up. And mm -hmm. I, I had never heard of that before. Right. Uh, so you click on one thing and we all know how we get into a rabbit hole, click on the next, keep reading, click on the next. And all of a sudden I was in this huge rabbit hole, but it was a great rabbit hole. And I had so many things were popping up that I had never heard of before. Uh, you know, neuroplasticity, pain reprocessing therapy, 
And I was reading a little bit and a little bit. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I think I'm on to something. Like, I think this really fits. It fits yeah. me. And Dan, I had never, ever in all the years that I was in chronic pain and all the different practitioners, doctors, young, old, middle-aged, <laughs> new, <laughs> old school, never once a peep out of anything even remotely close to this, you know, came out because I was always the, the perfect patient, whatever exercise physio or Cairo told me to do, whatever my doctor told me to try. I mean, I, I had a file folder of exercises and, you know, different, <laughs> different things that I was trying. So anyway, I'm looking through all this and then all of a sudden, um, Alan Gordon's book kind of popped up on the internet as well, The Way Out. Yep. So, you know, I clicked on that. And of course, there's always a little summary, reviews, et cetera. I was like, wow, this really sounds amazing. So, you know, ordered it into my Amazon cart. It's at my door in two days. Picked it up. It's a not really a long read at all. It's written very much in layman's terms with some humor sprinkled throughout it. Um, because as we know now, you know, Alan does have a kind of a different <laughs> kind of wit of humor about him. Yeah, Alan's a great and, yeah I mean, he wrote this book because he himself had uh, pain that nobody could figure out in the medical community, just like so many people that are, you know, like yourself that are in this mind body field now. So anyway, by the time I was halfway through the book, I was like, this this is my way out. I mean, I thought, well, the title for me is just yes. so, <laughs> uh, just bang on. Read the book. And honestly, I feel like just by reading the book, I was probably 30% better because my fear was dropping already. Exactly. Because once you understand what neuroplastic pain is, you know, the, the back issues and neck issues that I were so afraid of, there's nothing structurally going on there that's causing the sensations. So I'm not going to make anything worse by doing X, Y, Z. So like I immediately felt a lot of relief, a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, I thought, well, you know, I've had these neural pathways for 37 years. So they're pretty ingrained. I thought probably I should seek some professional assistance with this. And also, luckily, I had the resources to do that. I realize not everybody, sure. you know, has that. Okay. So again, went back to the internet. Um, I live an hour and a half from Ottawa, our nation's capital. I was hoping to find something there. <laughs> um, wanted to find something in Canada at the very least. So which I finally, I did pain psychotherapy, Canada out of Calgary, Alberta. So again, clicked on their website, started to read and lo and behold, they specialize in neuroplastic pain. Really their clinic, which I think has only been in existence for about two years, but it was set up their director, Tanner Murtaugh, also a former, you know, chronic pain patient. Um, and social worker. Uh, it was it's set up specifically for neuroplastic pain. All the therapists have either had chronic symptoms and sensations themselves, or are married to somebody, or has had a parent, a child. So they all have a very intimate relationship and, and knowledge with it. So you know everything I read on their website, I thought this, you know, after Alan's book being my way out, this is my continuation. So they have a 20 minute free consultation. So I signed up, had the 20 minute consultation, you know, signed up for my first appointment. And of course, they have to do an assessment to start with. 
And I said, you know, I realize you have to do this. But by then, I had done a lot of my own research, you know, part of my kind of overzealous, hypervigilant personality. But I guess in this sense, it it helped me. Um, I said, I know I have neuroplastic pain, and I know I'm going to get better. That is such a big, important step. Yes, I I just knew it, Dan. I mean, right into the core of my belief system. Yeah. What's interesting, I I've over the years I've kind of identified foundational things that are really required in order to get better. One is understanding the cause of pain. Right. Two is the assessment and decision that that is actually what's going on with me. Because if you don't know what causes pain and that it applies to you, how can you possibly convince this brain to let go of the pain? So you were able to, through your own investigation, research, awareness of your story, come to the conclusion of, okay, this is what's going on and it applies to me. And that, that gave you a perfect launching point. It, It really did. I mean, it, I mean, because I've had other people say that to me. Well, did you, you know, did you ever resist? I'm like, I just, there wasn't a question, do I resist or not? I just totally had the belief. It was like an organic thing Mm -hmm. that just happened with the book. And then when I did my first appointment, and not just did I believe this is what I had, but I I believed I could get better. I mean, there's the treatment. That's my fourth foundational (laughs) principle. What causes it? Does this apply to me? Is there a cure? And am I capable of implementing it? And you had all four of those, which is why from February of last year, what are we dealing with? 10 months later, no, nine months later, you're here on the doing a success story. And I do want to just point out, you said, well, I've got 37 years of neuroplastic symptoms going on. So right. assumption is probably going to take a while for these, what, but not necessarily, no, not no. necessarily at all. And I believe that the brain can make a decision to stop using those wires when it learns that they're not necessary. It's a, it's an alarm system. And if the brain learns there's no fire in the building, I can turn off the smoke alarm. Right. And you don't have to wait until those old roadways are fixed. Right. The brain literally creates a bypass around the neuropathic pathways of symptoms. And I know you don't like the word pain, but the pain pathways, um, the brain can literally build a bypass around it very quickly with the right information consistently. So I just wanted to qualify that for the listeners that neuroplastic pain does not mean it's going to take as long to unwire as you took to wire it right right right. no and and actually dan to be quite honest by the summer i was 90 percent symptom free i mean so it really it only took me three to four months to get 90 percent i i mean i was just amazed at the whole thing but yeah like it's with accurate accurate information and decisions do for you it's a brilliant brilliant example and case study of complete acceptance and then like you said the thing which you overcame which really is what provided you the results is the fear you were no longer afraid i was no longer afraid so even after (laughs) no i like it was just so amazing Because people say, well, what, you just went, I started just engaging, I just started doing things. I mean, engage in life, right? Re-engage in life. That's a big part of it. And they were like, yeah, but you did that with the symptoms? Yes, because I wasn't afraid of the symptoms. Hey, you did it for 37 (laughs) years and it never (laughs) broke your body. So what the heck? Now you know what's causing it. It's better. It wasn't a harmful decision that you made. It wasn't a dangerous decision. Yes, yes. So I'm so, sorry, I keep jumping in. This is a no, good no, and that's fine. So yeah, so I started the therapy. Um, my first appointment was mid March. So I, you know, I had read the book, then done the assessment, but you know, it takes a few weeks to get to get in for your appointment. 
but within those few weeks, I was doing my own <laughs> research, et cetera. Um, so within two or three appointments, I made kind of a huge decision. My husband was going to be away and there was this big sporting event going on in Ottawa. I'm a huge curling fan. And my favorite team was going to be in the gold medal game. My son lives down there as well. I never would have tried. I never would have done this if I hadn't started my therapy because I thought, okay, I don't even have my husband to drive me here. Yeah. You know, so I'm going to have to drive myself. I'm going to have to pack up an overnight bag and, and put things in the car. Well, my husband always did. <laughs> all that. I'm going to have to drive in the city. You know, I live in a small community where it's so with the traffic, all those kind of things that I'm not really that comfortable doing. And I'm going to have to go to the arena and sit in those seats. And that was always a huge no, no. I mean, that was one of my preconditioned responses. I mean, long sitting. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what? I have the confidence to do this. It's something I really want to do. And I'm going to go for it. So I texted my son. I was like, buy the tickets. I'm coming. And he's away like, I are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I know. He was like, are you sure? <laughs> I was like, this is your new mom. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. So away I went. I mean, I still stopped on the drive and got out of the car and moved around. I mean, uh, that still gave me some sense of safety. I don't have to do things like that anymore, but I was very new mm -hmm. into this, you know? So I still felt I had to do a few things that still made me feel safe, even though they weren't necessary, but um, cause this was kind of a big step I was doing. For sure. So we got there went to the arena um at one point you know we were in our seats and my sensation in the back of my neck was fairly moderate by that point mm -hmm. but I mean I knew what it was so again I wasn't afraid anymore I knew what it was and I would talk to my symptoms in my head or out loud depending on who I was with or where yeah. I was and uh, I was like, oh, you know, I symptom. him. Uh, of course you showed up because this is a really exciting sporting event. I mean, why why wouldn't you want to be here? It, it's exciting. Uh, you know, I get that. It's my favorite team. Yeah, I mean, of course you'd want to see it as well. But then I was like, well, why don't you go sit in the section over there? And Dan, when I did that, immediately within a split second – the sensation left my body. Now it came back, you know, 10 minutes later, but that was a huge aha moment that showed me how much control I could have over that symptom. And I mean, it doesn't always work. And it, oh, you know, when it, when it came back 10 minutes later and I told it to go back to the other section, it stayed for a while. It, it decided it liked the seat I was sitting in, but I still wasn't afraid of it. I, I knew what it was, you know, it's just my brain misinterpreting the sensation. So, I mean, we stayed for the whole game. We went out for supper, you know, I stayed overnight and the next night I was, or the next day I was draw and I, went to a store, did some shopping in Ottawa the next day. And I was driving home along the highway the next day. And all of a sudden I had the music cranked and I was singing along and I was happy <laughs> and I was joyful. And uh, in, in my head, I was like, wow, this person has been gone for a long time. <laughs> and, you know, here she is. And I was excited that I had done that and it gave me more confidence that even though I had confidence or I wouldn't have done it to begin with but I was like this this is it I'm I'm jumping into life both feet in just just going for it it's like yeah. I'm done with that yes because this is this is gonna work this is working I mean engage in life I think people find that hard to do sometimes. Yeah. One of the things that I always point out is that when we avoid activity, 
the only thing the brain is learning is that activities dangerous don't do it right so next time you go do activity because you kind of have to the brain's going what are you doing me, me. alarms go off so it's really Fear. up to yeah. us to be willing to experience the symptoms in right. order to teach our brain that they're not dangerous because right. if you avoid avoid right. everything your world gets smaller and smaller as you were explaining yes but it doesn't make the pain go away. It just makes your life get smaller. Right. So, um, right. yeah, what else do so you want to share? Yeah. Well, so uh, because that kind of worked so well, I just started graded exposure with lots of things. I mean, it was springtime. I hadn't been on a bike in, gosh, I don't know how long. I mean, Decades. so I was like, All right, I'm going on my bike. And I thought, well, the first time I'm going like four blocks. So off I went four blocks. Did I get sensations? Yes. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's, that's fine. I, I know, I Makes know what sense. you are. And yeah. So then the next day I, I was like, well, I'm going eight blocks and you know, maybe I got more sensations. Maybe I got less. Now I don't really remember because Dan, now I'm biking 30 kilometers. <laughs> I love it. So it, <laughs> it, it and the odd time I still get a sensation when I'm biking. I don't care. Like <laughs> That's don't it. Care. You don't care because you know what it is and you're not afraid of it. And yes. so people will be like, but how can you not be afraid of pain? <laughs> because I know what it is and it's just my brain sounding a false alarm. So why would I, why would I overreact to why it? Exactly, exactly. And actually, the sensations that I continue to get off and on when I bike is actually in my knee. Because like a lot of people, once I realized I have this mind body issue, and my main issues were always back, neck, shoulders, but I have a grocery list of, you know, 10 or 12 other things that now I look back at, and I'm like, Oh, my God, that was all TMS. All those things are TMS. I mean, it's, 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 fascinating really once you once you understand it i'm like it's all you know so i'm using like chronic pain but all these chronic symptoms it, they're all the same and you can treat them all the same way mm -hmm. they're all the same issue it doesn't matter what you call them you know the the fatigue the anxiety the you know dizziness insomnia they're all chronic symptoms being caused by the brain Okay. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you listed some of those out. Um, the fatigue, the anxiety, dizziness, insomnia, because they're very, lot more. very common. <laughs> I have a lot of people go, but I don't have pain. I've got this, this or that. Right. And they, they're they rattling off the things that you just listed off. Right. And it's yeah. all created in my perception by a scared brain. A brain right. perceiving danger creates Fatigue, anxiety, dizziness, back pain, sciatica in my case, migraines, right. reflux, pain. gastrointestinal problems. Yes, <laughs> yes. IBS symptoms. Yeah, yeah. You name it. Rashes. I even had rashes, and now I believe that they're TMS as well. Because I would just get these random rashes, like for no reason, and not very often. But now I look back and I think. Those were all TMS. I mean, I, I truly believe, you know, now I walk around thinking 90% of, <laughs> of all kinds of things are TMS, but yeah. I, I really, I really do believe that. Yeah. I'm of the same mindset. I, I believe the vast <laughs> majority of, I'll say chronic symptoms, persistent symptoms, persistent. the yes. vast majority are mistakes made by a brain perceiving danger. Right. Uh, Right. Okay. Great. For different reasons. Yes. Yes. So uh, actually, so one thing I probably should say when we just spoke about the anxiety a little bit is when my physical symptoms started to dissipate mm -hmm. within the first one, two, three weeks, and then, you know, the next two months, anxiety overwhelmed me, actually. <laughs> yeah. It like just through the roof. But by then I was far enough along and I had done enough of my own research 
I didn't, I wasn't worried about the anxiety. I welcomed it in. I mean, I recognized what it was. It was just my brain instead of the physical sensations. Now it was anxiety. So I really, I welcomed it in. I sat with it. I thought about how it felt in my body. So I would do that a little bit formally when it first started. You know, I would actually have this chair in my living room that I would just go in and sit. I was like, oh yeah, anxiety, you're showing up again this morning, you know? That's that's fine, you know, here you are, okay. Sit with it a bit, you know, process what it felt like in my body and then just take it along for my day. So whatever, wherever I was going, whatever I was doing that day, like welcome it to come along or if I was out somewhere at the mall and oh there there you are or out you know I started playing pickleball oh right. there you are you're here with me again you know stay as long as you like it would stay for a few hours and it came for oh a good three four weeks straight every day I wouldn't wake up with it, it would come a couple hours into my day and stay for a good part of the day and then leave but I was never afraid of it because I knew what it was. So my interpretation, yes. if I can share it, is that when you've done an exceptionally good job of teaching your brain that your body's okay, settles down, but your brain is still on high alert. Right. And you're still yes. pumping the adrenaline, the cortisol, which creates the physical sensations of anxiety, which you spoke about. How did this feel in my body? And along with the physical sensation of anxiety, we oftentimes go, that, well, that feels weird. What's going on? Oh, no, I've got anxiety. And the thoughts start to spin. And then you've got this yes. cascading stress hormones, stress thoughts, stress hormones, stress thoughts. And one of the reasons why you're able to allow it to run its course in a matter of weeks is that you recognized it and said, I don't have to do much with this. I'm just going to allow it, not judge it, not fear it, not run away from it, not resist it. Mm -hmm. And it ran its course because after a while, your brain actually learned, oh, you mean Jane's not afraid of this anxious feeling, <laughs> just like she's not afraid of the physical symptoms? Right. <laughs> oh, I guess she's okay. And this system still settles down even more. Even more. Yes, yes. Because you're right. I mean, I definitely also have the hypervigilant brain. I mean, we, you know, we I, all I, did. yes, that's right. Yeah. Because all the personality traits that most people with TMS or all people with TMS have, of course, I, you know, I, I checked off a lot of those boxes. So, um, so yeah, back to the Pain Psychotherapy Canada, we dove right in with pain reprocess pain reprocessing therapy, which, you know, for me, which just basically, like little... can you explain that briefly from your experience? Yes. Yeah, so from my experience, I mean, it's teaching your brain to look at the sensations in a different way. So you still have to acknowledge them. So it's not ignoring. And I think sometimes people, have trouble differentiating that it's not ignoring because ignoring won't get you anywhere either <laughs> well it's impossible it's... too well yes, yes like if your back is hurting it's right. literally impossible to ignore it because pain is designed to get our attention get our so attention. anytime somebody goes dan i'm trying to ignore my symptoms but i can't i'm like perfect right you're not supposed to ignore them it's impossible yeah. Don't judge yourself as not doing this correctly because you can't ignore them. And don't judge that I'm never going to be able to do this because I'm unable to ignore them. We don't have to ignore them, but I'll let you finish. How are you supposed yes. to observe the symptoms? Yes, yes. Well, in a more like a curious light manner, acknowledge that they're there, but be indifferent to them. So, yeah. you know, yes, I see you sensation, but it's, to me, I think as soon as I knew what it was, uh, you know, I'm I'm not afraid of it. So yeah. I'm not afraid. So it's fine that it's there. I understand what it is. And if today the sensation doesn't change, that's okay. Because you have to be outcome independent. Mm -hmm. The long term goal, obviously, is for the sensations to dissipate. 
but not for today and not for tomorrow, you know, as each day goes by, be indifferent, accept that they're there, but still go about your day as best you can. So I did somatic tracking quite a bit as, as part of that as well. And initially I would do it in a more formal sense, meaning I would kind of stop and sit and do it and listen to, listen to a structured, you know, video audio tape. I mean, that my therapist had sent me, but once I got comfortable enough doing that, I would do somatic tracking while I was out and about. I mean, you know, where, wherever I was, you don't have to stop and go hide in a room and close the door and you know, you're just like, oh, you know, there you are, sensational. I see. How are you feel? How are you feeling today? Oh, you're a little bit burning. No, oh, you're a little bit here. You're a little bit there. Oh, you're popping all over the place, maybe. You know, whatever it happens to be doing, because get curious as to why sometimes it's often a different sensation. Um, you know, and and and, and the key is observing with curiosity, not going oh my goodness what did it do now it just moved there oh ah right no, you know no. we're, we've eliminated the fear and we're viewing it with curiosity with fascination with interest yes because that, you know that what? takes it, away it the fear because you're saying it could never do what it's doing if it was structural i know dan i mean once you understand and that it makes so much sense I, you know yeah. um, and I do I still find it fascinating like you said so exactly that's what I would kind of be like oh you're over there now or oh I mean like the first time I went to play pickleball I had sensations literally popping all over my back in different like a ping pong almost and I was like well that's really fascinating I mean obviously structural could never do be that. doing that <laughs> i mean right. i'm like oh brain you're fascinating me today that you're doing this it's almost like each way the pickleball went the sensations were popping all over all sure. over the place as well um you know and i remember leaving pickleball that day and one of my girlfriends she said oh how was that for you and i was like oh my gosh there were sensations popping all over my back and she's like oh oh, maybe it's too much for you. And I said, no, I'm coming back tomorrow. And she goes, really? Why? And I said, well, yeah, to show my brain, it's safe to play pickleball. Love yeah. it. Love I it. Mean, perfect, you know, perfect implementation <laughs> of the right mindset. And mm -hmm. the foundation underneath that was your level of clarity. Right. It causes symptoms and it, it applies to me and I can do this. I'm not afraid of it. You can literally make a decision to say, Oh, I had a fear thought. No, I'm not going to buy into that. And I'm right. sure you had to counter many of those fear thoughts and say, no, not today. I'm right. not afraid <laughs> because I know what's going on. So perfect yeah. implementation. I talk about, you know, the word indifference. I've been speaking about mindset for many years. The mindset of indifference is extremely powerful because you're saying, maybe I'm not symptom free today and maybe not tomorrow. But so what? So Who much. cares? Doesn't matter because I know what's going on and I can do this, right? Yes. And taking away the time pressure, becoming outcome independent to say, okay, symptoms may happen. So what? Mm -hmm. They're not harmful. Mm -hmm. And it, I already know I've come to the conclusion that my body's perfectly fine. So isn't this fascinating? Yes how the brain sounds all of these warning signals and just perfect implementation. So for anybody who's going, I can't believe Jane got better from 37 years of pain in a matter of months. And we're at, at roughly nine or 10 months now, but like, like Jane was saying, much of those results were in the first few months. Yeah. So people who go, that doesn't seem possible. I've had pain for three years and I've been at this mind body work for three years and I'm still not better. Okay. Right. Well, evaluate. Where's your mindset? Where's your fear level? Where's your focus and your attention? Are you willing to expand your capacity by doing things, even if the symptoms show up? Right. Because that's the difference between folks who tend to struggle with this and folks like you, Jane, who are, you know, fast students of this and, implementing 
And a lot of this was intuition. It's not like you had a checklist to go, here's how you develop the right mindset. And here's how you respond if. Um, Like a lot of this was your intuition. And I think you were blessed after 37 years of symptoms um, to be able to go, holy cow, I'm done with that stuff. Right. (laughs) This makes sense. So I am all in. And you jumped in with both feet and you just said, this is it. I, I did, Dan, because I think like when I read the book or even before that, when I found this on the internet, mm-hmm. like I said, it just, I just knew it totally made sense. I mean, nothing else had ever worked or like it, it was just there. I was like, oh my God, where has this been all my life? This is, this is my solution. So yeah, I never wavered. I never doubted I just went and I you know I know you said there's not a checklist and there isn't but everything I had read I was just like well I'm doing it engage in life with Mm -hmm. or without the symptom I'm doing it because that's what I've read that the experts say is the best way to go about it yeah so uh, you know and it goes uh, all the way back to Dr. Sarno from the 80s was was resume all physical activities that was one of his, you know, 12 daily reminders. Right, right. And I, I've even heard Sarno tell, or people telling this story of when they went to see Sarno was at the end of an appointment, uh, he would say, now go live your life. There's nothing wrong with you. And, and I I know that's how he would dismiss patients from his office because right. <laughs> I've easily heard that story six, seven, eight times from people who went to Sarno 20 years ago. Okay, okay. So. And that's essentially what you're doing. You're you're living your life. There's nothing wrong with me. And even if some uh, sensations show up, you're going, I know what it is. So what? Yes, I know what it is. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not not afraid and I know what it is. And so I guess another big thing what I want to say is getting rid of the symptoms is great, but there's so much more to it than that because I just now have this joy and connection with life that I never felt before because I was living in survival mode. You know, I didn't really realize that at the time because it was really the only life I knew I was 20 when the car accident happened. But I mean, I still was, having a social life and seeing friends when I could on my good days, but I was making myself do it because I knew enough that my life would be worse or smaller if I didn't, but I didn't want to do any of those things, Dan. I was making myself do them. And now, I mean, life has just expanded so much and I and I feel like this authentic person has emerged that was always a person I was supposed to be but I I never had a chance to be that person (laughs) you know and I feel like I'm 58 now and this is like my life going forward now is so full of hope and joy and you know a year ago I thought my life going forward was to endure till (laughs) the end of my days it's it's just incredible what's on the other side of all that fear that people have Mm -hmm. and it's so worth fighting for and and you know going through the process to get there because i i never knew that this this was what life was like i really didn't it's (laughs) yeah it's a common experience that people start to smile again they start to laugh again yes i've literally sat you know, in a Zoom call with with people who said, I haven't smiled for five years. Right. You right. know, and that's what chronic symptoms can do to us. Yes. It can literally suck the life out of us and suck the joy, suck the motivation, suck everything out of us. And, you know, at the end of the day, I keep on telling people, you're not broken. You just think you are. Right. 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 Because you've yes. never been told you're not broken. Mm-hmm. I think you're broken emotionally, physically, or mentally. Um, right. We've just been operating on fear, and that fear yes. is driven by misinformation. 
the information that a car accident 37 years ago could still be hurting you today is ridiculous. The yeah. body heals. And, and now I know that and I believe that. And, you know, I read things now. Oh, well, within three to six months, your body should heal from anything. And I'm thinking, Absolutely. why did nobody ever tell me that before? I mean, Likely even quicker. But yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And no, it is. it is. It's so amazing um, what's on the other side of all of all these all symptoms. The well, yes. Yeah. What's on the other side of fear is... <laughs> everything everything yes everything that you know for some people they've never known really because you know not everybody has been in symptoms as long as i have but i said to somebody i said i didn't get my old life back because i didn't want my old life back because what what was my old life i mean uh, from the age of 20 on this is the life i had i said but i've got a brand new entire yeah. life that I, I've never knew existed. And, and, you know, I think, is this how, quote, normal people have walked around their whole life? Wow, I've really been missing out on a lot, but I'm so glad I'm here now. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many normal people have their own stuff. Well, yes. Whether yes. it be <laughs> the anxieties, the social awkwardness, the, the symptoms, sensations, gut problems, headaches, migraines, like you name it, there's probably thousands of different symptoms. And I know when we are racked with our own chronic symptoms, it's very easy to go, I'm the unlucky one. This is my fate. Right. Everybody else has a normal life. But when right. you really realize like how prevalent a lot of this stuff is, most people have their stuff. Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. And, you know, many are blessed not to fall into the, you know, decades long chronic trap, yes. but um, most people have something going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And I mean, I, I would never have believed this a year ago, but I can honestly say now, it seems like those last 37 years don't even matter anymore. Yeah. And it doesn't even sound like you're fearful of it coming back because your level of clarity and certainty and the fear has been reduced so much that you're like, it's not going to happen again. Because if I do get a sensation, I'm not going right. to fuel it with fear right. and attention. I'm yes. not going to get thrown off of my confidence back into the pillar of despair and fear and worry. Mm -hmm. that that is definitely how I feel because I do get the odd symptom now and then um you know usually in uh if there's something a little stressor going on no I get a symptom but I know what it is and I know that you know it's never spiral spiraling back to the chronic spot it was like I can if you don't give it fear no it can't <laughs> yeah it turn chronic because that's the, right the formula i've come up with is for chronic symptoms chronic pain is fear plus attention equals chronic right Doesn't matter what the symptom is right. and without you buying into the symptom and saying oh no i'm in trouble again here's more fear yeah it won't turn chronic so yeah. that makes you that much more certain that I don't have to worry about if I ever get a sensation again, because I'll know what it is and I'll know what to do about it. Yes. yes. And so no. I don't believe recovery is a perfect thing where you'll never feel a symptom again. No. That's not, and I agree with you. That's not the way this works. No. Recovery is when we recover from the fear of right. future symptoms or present symptoms. Yes. We're not fixing body parts. We're not and, and here's the thing. Some people get caught up in this because they're like, I'm feeling great. You know, I beat my symptoms. I beat my pains, whatever. And then six months later, it came back and it terrified me. Right. Time out. Time out. Don't allow symptoms returning to terrify you. Call it out for what it is. Hmm. Have the same level of clarity and certainty hmm. and it can go away. But so many people get caught up in it. This wasn't supposed to happen. I thought I beat it. Right. Who told you that, you know, eliminating symptoms meant you will never have another symptom again in your life? 
This is a human experience, folks, a human experience. We will get sensations when our brain does what? Perceives danger. That's right. its job to warn yeah. us. Yeah. Oh my goodness, you're playing pickleball. Watch out, watch <laughs> out, that elbow, this knee, that you know, back. And mm -hmm. it's our job to go, shh, I'm having fun. Right. <laughs> and it literally is the brain just doing its job. The brain's primary yes. focus from the time we're conceived till the time we eventually pass, safety and survival, period. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is um, you're realizing how happy you are. That's yeah. because for 37 years, your brain was focused on survival. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know where happiness and joy falls on the priority list? Right. Way below <laughs> safety and survival. <laughs> yes. Not important. But yeah. now your brain goes, wow, safety and survival. Jane is okay. Oh, yeah. those are handled. Now, guess what bubbles up to the surface? The ability to start enjoying life. Yes. Yeah. No, cool. and, it, and, and that part has been amazing. I mean, honestly, I, I wake up every day still in, in awe and gratitude. Lots of gratitude. I mean, you know, to my therapist in specific, but also to all of you that work in this mind body yeah. modality, um, because it's, it really is just amazing. And we need to keep shouting out <laughs> this message yeah. um, and trying to get more people on board with it. Because I think it, if I can do it, I mean, you know, I was just the lay person, a dental hygienist, I didn't have any special training in this uh, you know lo long years of symptoms lots of symptoms like like i said now laundry list of symptoms and so if i can get better the next person can can do it as well yeah it doesn't take any special qualifications it takes a willingness mm -hmm. to see your symptoms through a different lens Right. And what we're doing here is we're we're putting a lens of safety onto our symptoms where we've been looking through a lens of fear for as long as they've been around. And in many cases, even prior to that, many people, yes. uh, they've been on high alert since they were young children. Yes. Um, none of that matters. We can and, and the duration of symptoms. Jane's a perfect example that that doesn't matter. Thirty seven of symptoms. Uh, I've known people with 40 plus years of symptoms getting better. Um, so the duration doesn't matter. The intensity doesn't matter. The fact that you spent probably, I don't know, besides sleeping 20, right. 30, 40% of your time <laughs> laying on the floor, um, right. <laughs> that none of that matters mm -hmm. because the brain is always capable of learning and making new decisions about whether or not to turn on the the alarm system. Right. Um, right. Now, Jane said something funny before we started recording here, how she was like, oh, you're indoors. So, <laughs> um, I guess she's seen a lot of my outdoor videos, but that was kind of funny. I wanted to share that story. Um, <laughs> because well, I love the outdoors now I love nature I have I mean the pandemic also gave me a new appreciation of nature but some yeah. days I just feel like it's calling me to go outside and where I live, if I go like five minute drive, there's a river. Sometimes I'm just called to go look at nature as well, which I know is very healing for, you know, a number of different things as well. But well, we get sunlight in our eyes on our skin. Yeah. If the weather is cooperating, you're in Canada. So this time of year, you're not <laughs> exposing much skin not besides much. maybe this. <laughs> yes. um, but I think going outside expands our awareness because yes. when we are in chronic symptoms or pain for a long period of time, as as you explained, Jane, our world shrinks. We don't leave the house much. And our world becomes so narrow in tunnel vision and survival mode. And as we go outside, everything expands. Even if you're sitting on your front porch. Yes, yes. Things expand. Yeah. Oh, look, a squirrel. I had a fox run through my backyard the other day. And it was just mm -hmm. so cool. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, nature is not a cure in and of itself. But as we start to expand our world, just get outside, even if it's just at the front porch. 
just to get some fresh air, get this natural sunlight in our eyes, in our face, on our body, if if season applies. It's it is healing. It is. No, it definitely is. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else you want to add? This has been great. Oh, well, I mean, I I think I've kind of said it all, but, uh, you know, for the, those of you listening who are still questioning your, you know, your own symptoms and your own motivation, I mean, it's, it really, it, it's amazing. And, you know, believe it, believe, believe that you have mind body syndrome. There's nothing to be embarrassed about that. I'm proud now to say I have this and I'm spreading the word to, you know, to help others get, yeah. get to the same spot. Beautiful. Well, I applaud you. You, uh, you really grabbed onto this, held on, made a decision, your willingness to accept that this is what was going on and let go of all of those preconceived notions about your body and car accident and all that crap forgive my language um, <laughs> is why you did so well and why you did so well so quickly because you really just got to acceptance very quickly right. and that acceptance lowered your fear and your commitment to stick with that and your commitment to starting to expand your world and get out and do things even if the symptoms were there and your commitment to staying calm and reassuring and just clear that level of clarity is so important that's why you did so well so quickly and so for anybody who's struggling and aware of this stuff um evaluate how your mindset and your commitment and your acceptance compares to jane because she did, you did very well, very quickly. And, you know, I applaud you for that. And hopefully people will gain some clarity on what the road to getting better looks like. It's not without symptoms. It's not like you had poof, everything was gone instantly. <laughs> you felt wonderful. Um, you had some trials and tribulations through the, the stages of recovery but it was really laying that solid foundation that you know what causing the symptoms it applies to you and darn it i can do this yeah. that's foundational so i really uh really love your story thank you so much for sharing it anything well, else you want to say before we wrap this up well just thank you for having me dan and you know even if i just influence one person today it's well, you will. It's, so, it's so worthwhile <laughs> you absolutely will so, Jane, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And uh, all right, everybody, hope you got something out of this. Uh, again, Jane is a great example of what's possible and what it's going to take for you to follow her towards basically feeling fantastic. So love it. Thank you again, Jane.